Good morning, everyone, and welcome to World Affairs Fridays, sponsored by the Peoria Area World Affairs Council and our good hosts here at Bradley University. Today, we are delighted to have Mark Steinberg with us. Dr. Steinberg is a research, uh, is a professor of history, rather, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He also um, teaches in other departments on campus, in particular, Slavic languages and literatures, and the unit for criticism and interpretive theory. He, his research focuses on the city, revolutions, emotions, violence, space, moralities, and utopia. Some of his more recent publications, um, Ghostly Fogs in a Decaying Empire, Disoriented and Melancholy Experience in Russia's Metropole, which was published in Cultural Studies uh, in 2020, in Russian, State, Religion, and Church in Russian and Worldwide. Um, in 2019, he um, edits or co-authors one of the textbooks that I use to teach students here at Bradley, A History of Russia. Mm -hmm. His latest edition was in 2018. Um, and I'll just add this one because Mayakovsky is one of my favorite poets, Vladimir Mayakovsky and the Utopian Imagination of the uh, Russian Revolution was published in 2018, um, also in a Russian publication. So welcome, Dr. Steinberg, and tell us what you know about Russian utopia. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me and thank all of you for coming. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, well, in a moment, I will show, share my screen um, and hopefully it will work. Uh, I'll pause it at that point, but it's, it's nice actually to see at least some of your faces and many of your names and uh, th this strange genre we're all learning to live in, right? Um, so uh, as mentioned, I, I developed an interest recently in the last several years in thinking about utopia. Uh, and that was partly leading up to the uh, 100th anniversary of the 1917 revolution. It was also leading up to a, one of the many I think the 500th year of Thomas More's Utopia. And so I began thinking about this category and as have some others. And so I was, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I think utopia means. But I have this book that's including the stuff about Mayakovsky and others, uh, which is simply called, well, I wanted it to be just called Russian Utopia, uh, but the editors wanted a subtitle. So it's, the, as you see, it's the same as my talk, A Century of Revolutionary Possibilities. It's actually even more than a century. Uh, and it'll come out this fall. It's published in London by Bloomsbury in a series of short books. So uh, that, that'll be nice. Uh, and one might say that what this book is about is stories. And you'll see I like to tell stories uh, and dreams. Uh, historical stories and dreams to be sure, because they unfold, and I'm a historian, they unfolded in a particular time uh, and place, which was Russia from uh, roughly the dawn of the 19th century, though sometimes goes back further, into the middle of the 20th, at least through the Stalin era, though one could go beyond. But I wanna say that even though I'm a historian primarily of Russia, good stories, all good stories, I think, reach beyond the particular time and place. Uh, they speak of bigger uh, things, uh, sort of like folk tales, uh, they have a moral. And I'm always interested in what is the moral of the story that we uh, are looking at. And the moral of these stories, of the books, the stories I have in Russian Utopia, uh, is sort of a odd moral, uh, or sometimes a paradoxical one, or even one hard to completely figure out, which is to see what is not yet real. There's a paradoxical statement for you. To see what is missing, what people feel is missing in their own present, uh, the past's present, uh, as it were, to try to figure out what might lay beyond the moment that they live in. And of course, dreams always do this, right? Especially daydreams or what one scholar has called dream consciousness, something you do when you're not sleeping, but connects to what you do when you're sleeping. Uh, also always looks beyond the horizon of what we know to be sort of the immediate here and now, um, toward something desired, something perhaps possible, but not yet realized. And this, I think, and I'll come back to this idea, is what many recent writers, although some of them go back to the beginning, the middle of the 20th century, uh, called the utopian method uh, or the utopian impulse uh, or the, simply the spirit of utopia. And I'll come back to this idea. What I mean by this idea of this spirit of utopia that I'm describing in Russia in this new book um, 
and how I think it helps us understand Russian history uh, in the modern era and the Russian Revolution, the long Russian Revolution in particular, 1917, but what preceded and led to it and followed it, uh, I think will become clearer when I tell some stories, which I believe in doing, though they're odd stories and the, uh, of many that are in that book, the ones I wanna focus on here uh, as I indicate, as you saw, if you saw the blurb about the talk, the synopsis of it, is a distinct and maybe odd, surprising Russian obsession, going back to the early 19th century, uh, with wings, literally wings, and with flight, in particular, human uh, flight. And the story begins in Moscow, uh, the first story I want to tell, on Red Square, next to the Kremlin Wall, in the fall of 1918. Now, let me see if I can share my screen. So you, we can, I can take you there or I wanna take you. Now let's see, share screen, always these technological things and see it look nice. Okay, there we go. So, th so the place I wanna take you, actually I'll come back to it very precisely. As I said, is fall of 1918 on the first anniversary of the Bolshevik revolution. Uh, in 1917. As you probably all know, the Bolshevik Revolution celebrated in November is in honor of an event that took place in October because of, of a telling change of calendar into a more modern European calendar. But before I take you to that place, Moscow, Red Square, next to the Kremlin Wall, November of 1918, the first anniversary, I want to set the stage very briefly, um, including something of the mood at the moment of this event that I wanna talk about. So the 1917 revolution in Russia, as you probably know, which brought down the monarchy first, uh, Nicholas II and the entire Romanov dynasty, never to return, uh, and then brought down a temporary government that was established uh, right after, that's in February of 1917, which made an effort to unite all the different political points of view and even all the social classes around a basically democratic ideal of a new, of a new society, liberal democratic uh, goals. This was a time, uh, 1917, full of uh, hope and uh, promises, uh, including when the Bolsheviks came to power, uh, which they did in, after only seven months of this democratic government in October of 1917, November on the European uh, calendar. Thinking about what people desired and hoped for, dreamt of in 1917, helps set the stage for the story I'm gonna start with and the ones that'll, that'll follow. In the short term, people were, as you can, you can see some of the banners from the time from one of the marches in June. In the short term, the goal was to end the horrors of World War I. Uh, the Bolsheviks did this, of course, by abandoning the allies and abandoning the front. But the long-term goal was always to end all war not just to end this war, to end wars. The short-term goal that people desired, that really in the streets, was to give people bread. Bread was the dominant demand in the streets. People go marching down the streets shouting, bread, bread, or give us bread, which of course meant food, because people were literally hungry. It also meant their whole standard of living, because the long-term goal wasn't just bread now, it was to end poverty altogether, forever. The short-term goal, especially for peasants, uh, which was the majority of the population, was that the land should go to those who worked it. It's a almost universal peasant uh, demand that uh, we're working the land, why don't we own this uh, land? Uh, and it was seen as an immediate solution to peasant needs, to hunger, to poverty, uh, to all sorts of deprivations, but also the goal was a step toward a long-term goal of let's have an economy with no bosses very common goal shared by workers. Uh, and not least, uh, as you can see in, in uh, some of these slogans for some of those demands, uh, it became a demand for all power to the Soviets, one of the sort of big ones. Soviets were elected councils, Soviet just means council, of workers and soldiers, eventually peasants were involved. Uh, but the longer goal, the reason to demand all power to the Soviets was this idea of a world in which the majority, the people as they would call it, uh, decided how society was organized, not just the rich and powerful. These are stories and dreams with long histories in Russia and beyond. Many Russians really believed, and I'm leading now to my moment on, on Red Square, really believed they were doing something huge with 
these, even what seem like immediate demands and their long-term potential uh, goals. And remember, this is in the midst of a catastrophe of uh, a terrible, terrible war. And in the midst of this, the worst possible catastrophic moments, they're dreaming of transforming the world in ways I've described, but maybe even more, maybe just almost like a new world uh, that would change everything, not just Russia, but the world uh, forever. It's almost, in, here you see one of the posters, uh, an early Soviet poster of this international vision of, you know, the workers of the world overthrowing uh, capital, gold, the, the monster of, of capital, which also includes is attached to religion and, and other things. These dreams were very radical, not just coming from the state. And what's really actually hard to exaggerate what people dreamed of, and I've read a lot of the people's voices from that period, it's also very difficult to exaggerate how disappointed people would become. And that's part of the story as well. So in other words, this is the setting. One year into Soviet power, November of 1918, there was good reason to worry, to feel danger everywhere, to feel great vulnerability. The economy was in shambles. Hardly the, the new society had been created. A civil war was all but inevitable and indeed would break out and last for three years. Uh, journalists described the public uh, mood. You can see some of the phrases in November of 1917. So already very quickly, but that the press was less able to talk about what people were feeling a year into the revolution. But right away, journalists were describing the public mood as anxious, confused, depressed, frightened, and this was persisting. Opponents of the regime, people who rejected communism, uh, condemned the Bolsheviks for doing nothing but uh, bringing more suffering and destruction to the nation, right? You see the phrase here, a new stage on Russia's path of thorns. The Christian reverence is, is quite clear. By contrast, enthusiasts uh, declared this to be uh, a sort of apocalyptic final battle, they often use that phrase, against the old world, the, and I quote, the long awaited great hour for the realization of the great slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Mixture sort of religion and French revolution and old ideals uh, all tied together. So the first anniversary, November of 1918, where, this, where the story begins, was steeped in other words, in both desire dreams of both immediate and long-term transformations and great anxiety and fear. Uh, and I, I wanna emphasize this, that revolutions, in fact, just much, much of history, but revolutions in particular are never just social and political events, though they are that too. They're always intensely wound up with emotions. Uh, and emotions, of course, are always uh, part of what forms and shapes and is influenced by ideas. So where I promise to take you, the first story. So in preparation for this first anniversary, uh, the government held a design competition uh, to put up a, a memorial plaque uh, in, uh, that would be unveiled in what was, one can hardly describe it as anything other than a sacred place on a sacred date, right? The first anniversary of the Bolsheviks coming to power in the, on Red Square, on the wall of uh, the Senate Tower, one of the big towers of the Kremlin, uh, facing Red Square, directly over the graves of people who died fighting in the revolution, in particular for Soviet uh, power. This is a, you've seen pictures of this place a million times uh, because this is where Lenin's tomb sits. And behind Lenin's tomb are all the graves of these revolutionaries and other important Soviet leaders, uh, other who were seen to be honored uh, th this is the sort of, you know, most sacred site of the dead of the revolution, uh, as it were. So one can argue this is a, an incredibly important site, sacred, dare I say, and uh, a sacred date, the first anniversary. So what you're looking at is, and I'll now want to show you a photo of it on the wall, um, is the winning entry. Uh, it's by a sculptor named Sergei Konyonkov. Uh, it was unveiled on this date, November 7th, 1918, first anniversary. So on that day, Red Square, you can imagine this is filled with people. Uh, and you've seen pictures of Red Square, this huge space uh, in front of what, where now the Lenin Mausoleum stands, the entrance to the Kremlin, filled with people, mostly delegates chosen by factories and 
uh, soldiers who uh, various units sent their representatives and all the local Soviets and other cities. Uh, this was a big deal, uh, the first anniversary. And this was the most important place for it. The, the capital of the government had moved uh, to Moscow at that point. On the podium, a little bit raised stage was exactly what you're looking at in the photograph, were all the leaders of the Soviet uh, state and of the Communist Party, the Bolshevik uh, Party. Lenin, I have a little arrow so you can see him standing over there at the, in the corner, gave the main speech. Uh, Yakov Sverdlov, you can see him also with the arrow, was formerly head of state. Lenin was head of the party. Uh, Sverdlov was head of state. It's a very complicated relationship, doesn't matter. All the leaders uh, are there. And given the time and place of the inst this installation and the people who were there and the official prog process of selecting it, all of which I've just briefly described, I think it's fair to say that this image that we're looking at may be the most authoritative uh, visual interpretation of the revolution. And by the way, it may remained in that place until the 1930s uh, when it began to disintegrate and had to be taken down. So as the curtain, and we'll, you can see the image again here, as the curtain covering this thing, this super important image, largely forgotten, uh, I've given a talk about this in Moscow, uh, and Muscovite said, really? Never heard of this thing, where is it? I don't know, I don't believe you. I had to show them photographs to prove that it was there. One art historian had never heard of this thing. So as this curtain comes down on this enormously important work, uh, visual representation of the ideas and meaning of the revolution, the crowd saw this gigantic uh, bas-relief, brightly colored, it's made of colored cement, uh, dominated by, and it's the images that are interesting here, a bare-chested, golden-skinned figure uh, with huge white wings, all that white are, are uh, uh, the wings of this figure, except for the, the skirt. Uh, the skirt's a sort of cl vaguely classical sort of skirt. And up top on uh, the person's head is a crown of eagle feathers. All a bit weird, actually, when you think about it, but it's just thick with symbolic uh, elements. And they're drawn from many different cultures, a point I may come back to, many different cultural sources. Uh, obviously, the figure itself uh, is intended as female, uh, according to the artist, but visibly ambiguous in gender. I mean, you really can't tell looking at uh, the figure. And angels were, of course, always androgynous. They were men uh, often, but you really could hardly tell. Uh, uh, so I'll call her her now, uh, because that's what the artist wanted. Uh, she, of course, there are her wings, right? And I'll come back to the meaning of wings. That's obviously one of the things I want to talk about. Uh, there's also a palm branch, obviously a very familiar symbol of martyrdom, of victory, uh, heaven. Uh, Palm Sunday, of course, uh, is associated with this. Here we are right in the mid appropriate at the moment we're talking um, in terms of the Easter season coming, Good Friday uh, and the rest. Uh, the long red banner, which you can see, uh, the red banner is the traditional symbol of revolution, of socialism, but always at its origins and still uh, of the blood of the fallen for socialism. The rising sun in the background, whose rays actually are a word, they spell out October 1917 revolution. On the ground, you see broken swords and guns wrapped in mourning bands. This is a, a memorial stuck into the ground, obviously not to be used anymore, both broken and, and stuck in the ground. Uh, and two fallen red flags, one of which has a hammer and sickle at the very top in a star, and one topped by clasped hands. Uh, and the golden words written on the, the red banners to the fallen in the struggle for peace and brotherhood of peoples. In case this hybrid, wild, bit bizarre visual imagery wasn't enough, the unveiling was accompanied by a performance of a cantata, that's what it was called, written by three working class poets uh, and, a, and a composer and performed by a workers choir. And so imagine this, with this huge crowd in Red Square, uh, the leaders of the party in the state on the podium, this gigantic thing that the, the uh, curtain had just come off of, this choir is singing um, before what I, I like to call her an angel of revolution. That's my name, not Konyonkov's. And by the way, the revolutionary dead at their feet, the choir is singing of, as you can see some of the words here, crucifixion and resurrection, right? Words like this come down from the cross 
These are workers, a proletarian choir singing in Red Square. Uh, come in the first anniversary of the Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution. Come down from the cross, crucified people, and be transformed. Roar land with the final storm. Let a new day shine in the azure, the old world transfigured. This might all seem really strange. How could this bizarre hybrid angel be an official communist image of the revolution, which is what it was, to be seen by everybody in Red Square for decades? Why would a proletarian choir be singing about crucifixion, resurrection, and salvation, even metaphorically? Perhaps even more odd, which is why I've begun with this story, it wasn't surprising to anybody. Lenin personally didn't like it. He thought it was a little bit much, but actually most people thought this is normal. This is the way we talk. Uh, the language and iconography of the revolution, which of course is meant to embody beliefs, was full of winged and flying figures, including resurrected ones. Uh, and as I said, it's hard to exaggerate the transformation in the history of the world uh, in life that people thought they were uh, what Paul thought the revolution was all about. At least one other proposed design for this memorial, the one that was actually the runner-up, they liked it a lot, but this one was, had more color to it, which is actually why they chose it. And by the way, the colors are identical to those on St. Basil's Cathedral just around across uh, the square. Uh, here was another design that wasn't accepted. It was the runner-up with, again, a bare-breasted, winged, genius of freedom, that's what the artist called it, a genius of freedom, uh, in the air above these two semi-nude workers leading the masses during what was described by the artist as the final and decisive battle, which of course is a line from the Communist International's anthem. It's also very a uh, reference to uh, apocalypse, uh, to revelation. Other approved art, as you can see a couple of examples, also included these sort of angel-like figures, uh, often blowing trumpets, presumably blowing trumpets to sound victory, uh, but also clearly like the archangels Gabriel and, My and Michael, sounding at least symbolically, the coming of the Messiah, the last judgment, the overcoming of all evil, the resurrection of the saved. Uh, this imagery and its association with revolution, with socialism, uh, had a long history, including in Russia, uh, not only in Russia, though. Uh, and in fact, this tradition was strongest among working class poets and writers who would become right, proletarian writers after 1917. A long history of using flight uh, and wings to talk about revolutionary change, transcendence of the world of the present, universal uh, emancipation, for example. And I could I could spend 10 hours giving you examples when I won't. Uh, so just a couple of many, you'll have to trust me how common these were. Um, this is in January of 1914, so even before World War I. Uh, the trade union paper of the St. Petersburg Union of Metal Workers, the most pro-Bolshevik labor union in the Russian Empire, published a poem by its president, not just some strange guy who writes a little weirdly, but Alexei Gastyev, the actual president of the union, who was a, a worker, um, with lines that you can see here uh, as part of a longer uh, poem, uh, higher still, yet higher. In the smoke of victory, we dash from the highest rocks, from the most treacherous cliffs to the most distant heights. We have no wings. We will. They will be born in an explosion of burning wish. Tons of people were writing like this uh, during the 1917 revolution, and especially after October, because this sort of imagery was much more uh, appealing to communists, in fact, uh, wings and flight in 1917 were even more ubiquitous. Uh, for example, the first example of many, in May of 1917, the uh, newspaper of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, a very influential left-wing party that briefly was allied with the Bolsheviks and then split with them, published a poem by Pyotr Aryashin, uh, a working-class poet who stayed active in, in, when his party was suppressed, uh, but because he sympathized with the revolution, he described, as you can see in these lines, the experience of revolution as flying across fields on what he called the fiery wings of time. He's flying across these fields. Uh, in 1919, to give one more example of a great many, 
uh, a Bolshevik poet named Vasily Alexandrovsky, also a worker, former worker. After 1917, they became full-time proletarian uh, poets. He went all around the country reading a very popular poem titled, what else? Wings, uh, in which, as you can see from some of the lines here, the bloodshed of war and revolution, that's what he's describing, are suddenly overcome because all that flowing blood turns into overpowering lava and everyone grows wings to transcend the uh, sort of rivers of blood. Not blood, but lava boiled there and all were winged, he, he, he concludes. So as you can already see, by the way, here, that the, this whole thing with revolutionary wings and flight, which was everywhere, uh, was linked to resurrection. Literally, the word was used all the time. Um, just to take, again, one, one out of many, many examples where this was explicitly stated, uh, Mikhail Gerasimov, not just, uh, not just any random worker poet, but an enormously important one. He was a, a, a worker, a former railway worker. Uh, he was a leader of the, uh, what was called the Prolet Kult. It was the movement for proletarian culture. That workers choir that sang in Red Square was a Prolet Kult uh, choir. In fact, he was one of those three worker authors of the cantata sung on Red Square uh, over the graves of the dead of October when the Konyonkov Memorial was, uh, was unveiled. He published a poem in 1918 uh, called simply, We are flying. There's many such uh, poems. Uh, it's in a proletarian collection, collection of proletarian writing from the proletarian called Fire Winged Factory. That's what you, see, you actually see uh, the cover or the title page of it. And it uh, opens with a worker's, you can see some of the words, deliverance, his poem, deliverance from the horrible deadening life of factory work uh, as resurrection and then flight to the sun. Uh, and by the way, this phrase fire winged was one of the most widely used adjectives uh, after October for talking about the revolution. The revolution was fire winged. People were fire winged. Okay, you've heard enough of these many potential examples. What is going on here? How do we explain that communists, and by the way, they proudly call themselves godless communists. That was a term uh, they use. It wasn't enough to say they were atheists. They like to say they were godless communists. Uh, embracing wings, angels, magical human flight, resurrection as ways to express the meanings of the revolution. What, how do we understand this? So I think uh, they tell us, which is why I'm telling you these stories, something important about what the revolution uh, meant in its own time. Sort of history lived, history experienced, interpreted as it's happening, that is much deeper than asking questions about surface ideology. Well, what, are the, what are the ideas of Marxism? Did they understand them or not? This is that place where ideas and emotions come together and therefore the meaning of this moment in Russian history meant for people we, we can see. And I think, I'll go even further and push this as, a, as an interpretation. Um, and this, but this is an interpret my interpretation based on uh, many years of trying to understand uh, Russian history uh, over the long term, the Russian Revolution, especially from the beginning of the 20th century through uh, Stalinism. It seems to me that this imagery, as weird as it was and yet widely accepted, expressed widespread ideas uh, and feelings about the Russian Revolution, ideas shared by many, many in Russia, uh, and indeed one might say shared in many countries when people make revolutions, uh, namely the deep human impulse to believe in the face of an often catastrophic reality, no shortage of those in history, that the sort of what we might call the harsh continuum of history, just history just keeps going, it never changes, it's we're not getting improvement, that this sort of harsh continuum might be somehow torn open so that humanity can transcend this everyday, profane, restricted world. Now, there's, I know, a lot of ideas packed in there. I'll explain what I mean, but I'll do so gradually and more with stories than just more uh, words. And one way to get at this is to say, where did all this come from? What do we, where, did, where did all this imagery come from? Where was it taken from? Uh, what were the influences and what do we learn about that? 
uh, to help us understand why it was so compelling, why they kept talking about wings and flight and resurrection uh, and the like. Because uh, clearly it drew a lot of, a lot of strands together. In fact, Konyonkov, the, the artist who created the work, which you see there again, um, Konyonkov said he wanted to create, and he, he was successful, they embraced it, an image of the Russian Revolution that had, in his words, global resonance, global uh, resonance, which fits the self-image of the Russian Revolution in many ways. Uh, surely it's, it's fairly obvious it was influenced by revolutionary representations of um, freedom, uh, which were well known. I mean, totally cliches uh, almost, uh, or liberty. Uh, sometimes called. The most famous, of course, for Russians would have been uh, the Marianne of the French Revolution, uh, but also the figure on top of the U.S. Capitol, more familiar to us, uh, which is, by the way, uh, and Konyonkov actually knew about it, a hybrid of, of its own way, dressed in both classical, going back to the ancient world, and Native American clothing, and by the way, not coincidentally, wearing a crown of eagle feathers, exactly like Konyonkov's uh, figure, angel of uh, revolution. In fact, these sorts of female figures with wings, often, as you can see uh, down on the left, blowing trumpets, uh, were really common in the revolutionary art as allegories, the allegorical art of revolutionary France, early uh, US Republic, and of course, were, was meant to, uh, and they're usually female here, to represent sort of symbolically the embodiment of some sort of virtue, usually truth and justice and freedom. This, by the way, was uh, picked up uh, in socialist art uh, very widely. And again, just a few examples, you can find dozens of examples of 19th and early 20th century socialist art when a winged female figure, sometimes blowing a trumpet, uh, was meant to be the symbol of socialism. Here's just a few of these many uh, examples. Obviously, they have deeper roots, right? Both the sort of French and American revolutionary ideas of liberty and these socialist angels, uh, they derive from uh, classical models, ancient models, in particular, uh, Nike, the goddess of victory, uh, Roman Victoria, uh, sometimes carrying, as here, a palm branch. So there's another palm branch mixed in from classical uh, times. And of course, uh, there was the Christian iconography of angels, right? The angels in the Bible uh, associated, importantly, when thinking about what the meaning might have been, the battle between good and evil, right? Angels meaning pointing toward salvation through some sort of apocalypse. In other words, a promise of a messianic age, the coming of the Messiah and a new world. And of course, not least, as, as I already mentioned, the archangels, especially Michael, who you can see in these two icons at the bottom. If one moves closer to the time of the revolution uh, and outside of formal church art, one sees again, dozens of images of flight and wings and angels in the work of Russian writers and, and artists. I'm giving one example, one of the more famous uh, by Natalia Goncharova, a great modernist uh, artist at the time, simply called Mystical Images of War. This is from the wartime uh, years. Uh, and here again, you see the Archangel Michael on a winged horse with trumpet, Bible, uh, censer, or you can move in a more modern uh, direction. Um, and note one of these images is simply called angels and airplanes, human flight, but also war, but also the outcome of war uh, and angels, uh, is a endless talk about airplanes, an obsession with air flight. One might say the technological modern version of human uh, flight, sort of Icarus and Daedalus, but with an airplane, uh, and hopefully with better fate than Icarus and Daedalus. Uh, and the symbolic importance of airplanes at the time was enormous. It wasn't just a thing that was out there. People viewed them as the modern technological embodiment of the old, ancient, deep dream of human flight. Uh, in Russia, just to give one example of, of many, uh, air flight became really a cult. There really was truly a cult of aviation in Russia uh, before the revolution and continuing through the Stalin era. Uh, certainly here you see a poster where uh, there's of course Stalin uh, standing on uh, Lenin's mausoleum, 
Uh, so actually right behind here would be Konyonkov's image, it's just not shown. Uh, with the airplanes flying overhead, the first one's Lenin, the second airplane is named Stalin, it goes on with other leaders and writers and the like. And on the right, you can sort of see right here, uh, that's Stalin's name spelled out with airplanes. All this airplane imagery, one could go, I could, I could give a whole talk just on airplane imagery. And of course, we know what the Russians thought about space flight and how important that uh, became. Above all, though, uh, I think it's worth recognizing now that I've taken you deep into cultural heritages of all sorts, and this might be the most surprising part, and it should be surprising, actually, is how well this imagery of flight and wings and angels and resurrection uh, fit with Marxism, in particular Soviet uh, Marxism. It's actually not surprising that Konyonkov's work really impressed the selection committee, um, because really at the heart of the socialist and especially Soviet Marxist sort of self-regard was that all of history was coming together, all of human history in revolution to create a new heaven and a new earth, as they would say, a new culture, a new human being. This was sort of the, the Marxist version of, of a classic and also biblical uh, narrative. In particular, there is a Marxist idea of revolution as a type of flight. Uh, there's a famous metaphor, very made popular by, uh, often report, originally written by Engels, but it echoed something Marx had said and constantly repeated, which said that socialist revolution is a leap from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom. Basically a flight from one type of existence to another, a human, the leap of humanity. And many, many people would repeat this idea as a sort of canonical uh, saying within uh, Marxism. In some ways, the most interesting and slightly different version of that is by a, a Marxist philosopher, a German a Jewish Marxist philosopher named Walter Benjamin or Walter Benjamin, uh, who wrote a very famous essay in 1940 called On the Concept of History, where he described socialist revolution as a leap in the open air uh, of history, which he says was a leap, drawing on, of course, that Marxist phrase, that would offer humanity that a momentary possibility, now I quote from his words, you see them there, to blast open the continuum of history. In other words, history is just step-by-step -step change, but also history as suffering, as catastrophe, and would allow humanity to, what he says, grasp the splinters and flashes of messianic time open to the future. This brings us back to utopia um, as an idea. And this theme, I think, can be seen uh, as pervading all this imagery I've been talking about and these Marxist ideas that are connected uh, to it. All of the history of visions of flight as we see them at that one moment, sort of coming together in 1918, but as part of something much larger. This sort of imagery that goes from biblical angels to socialist angels, we might put it that way. And as I suggested at the beginning, utopia, the idea of utopia, as I want to use it, as I use it in, in my new book, uh, I mean it not in the conventional sense that we usually use utopia, and so did many Russians at the time, uh, as an impossible place that will never exist. Uh, no grounding in reality, a dangerous dream, imposing perfection, et cetera, et cetera, on an all too human world. I'm using utopia, uh, as many philosophers did in the 20th century, um, in a different way. And in particular, you see the quotes from Ernst Bloch, also a German Jewish Marxist, uh, but unlike Walter Benjamin, he escaped the Nazis, uh, fled to America, where he continued to write. Benjamin did not. Uh, as a critical way to understand and act in the world, this is what utopia could be, as an extraordinary real possibility in the face of dark reality. This is the type of utopianism that connects these winged figures, I think, and thinking about the Russian Revolution. To be very brief, for Bloch, this, he called it utopian impulse, can be found all across human culture. And it's basically a rejection of the world as it has become. What he called the darkness of the lived moment. The possibility of reaching toward what is not yet, but is still possible. Though we often think it's impossible, the not uh, yet. Uh, because our imagination of what's possible is limited by the world we live in. 
Uh, and you see the line from 1918, his more lyrical, poetic version of this, which is really an image in some ways of flight, uh, that we summon what is not, build ourselves into the blue, and there seek the true, where the merely factual, the world as it is, disappears. This is a type of flight, I would suggest, uh, a leap in the air of historical possibility to use Benjamin's. And I could go on with other examples. If you're curious, we can talk about it later. This is utopia, in other words, as a critical method to question and overcome all that is dark and disappointing and frustrating in the reality of the present. Uh, and you can see examples of people describing it as a, a, not a floor plan, but a source of disruption of the present, a sense that the world is not enough. Whole series of very interesting thinkers have tried, suggest that I didn't invent this way of thinking about utopia, but I'm trying to apply it to these stories. But let me go back to Russia. Where this sort of utopian vision was absolutely everywhere and going way before the revolution, but certainly part of the revolution. As I said, these were times of terrible economic crisis, the darkness of the lived moment, uh, political fragility, enormous uncertainty. And yet people saw right into the, in those terrible times, the sparks of possibility, right? As I've said, government by the common people, factories run by workers, farms controlled by the people who work the land, ending police and replacing it by people's militias, uh, all the national minorities of Russia completely free and united with all the other nationalities after the fall of the empire, women completely equal to men in dignity, respect, and rights. And the reasoning for these dreams was simple. This is how most humans feel the world ought to be and therefore could be. An interesting logic. If it should be, and we know it as human beings, it can be. This is the definition of utopia that Bloch and others have tried to suggest that I'm using. Of course, these were feelings as much as ideas. Um, emotional ideas, ideological emotions. And I could give examples, but I see times passing and I want to be sure we have time for discussion. Um, so many, and notice here's from 1917, the sort of, uh, this is Christ is risen. This is an Easter card from Easter of 1917, uh, in which it links freedom of the nation to Christ. This was very common imagery uh, among believers, but also among non-believers. This has made sense metaphorically, the new age. And one could see one of many, many quotes such as this from a newspaper, Really the sense that as it begins, no longer does the vision of a new Russia appear as merely a future promise. It appears as real possibility. And it goes on on these uh, terms. It's as if it comes like a hurricane and tears out freedom. These are all very similar images to what I've been describing. By the 1920s, people understood how difficult it was to create this world. The hurricane, as it were, did not simply come and transform uh, the world as desired. People didn't simply grow wings and fly into the new. But people continued to dream of possibility. Um, and I could give many examples. I'll just point to one. Uh, it's very authoritative, Lev Trotsky. This is in 1923, who says this amazing thing. And he was a normally quite practical man. He organized the Red Army. Uh, he could be quite cynical when needed be, but he, like many, were talking about what the world was emerging as, uh, and again, almost an image of flight. Humanity will seek to create a higher social biological type, a superman, if you will. Uh, we can go into all the Nietzsche in this. The human being will become incomparably stronger, smarter, more subtle, subtle. His body will become more harmonized, his movements more rhythmic, his voice more musical. The average human type, you can only see him growing wings, right? Will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe, or a Marx. And above this ridge, new peaks will rise. Humans will uh, rise. None of this was unusual as a way to think and feel at the time. But of course, we know how this all turned out. We know the shall we use some of the quotes that I've mentioned, the free air of possibility, the open air of possibility didn't stay open. Uh, wings, to be metaphorical about it, because we've seen a lot of metaphors here, wings were clipped. Uh, angels were literally suppressed. Venturing beyond, to use one of Bloch's phrase, was banned, literally, you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, necessity, not freedom. 
remember the phrase, socialism, the leap from the kingdom of necessity to freedom, necessity, not freedom, reigned supreme uh, again. Needless to say, people were terribly disappointed, those who believed in possibility. They began to actually feel that this was utopianism in the sense of the impossible. History, humanity as it is, we're never going to achieve any of these wonderful things that we know should be and therefore we thought uh, could be. It was just utopianism, they would say. But, but I think we have to ask, looking backward, can we dismiss as mere vanity the many, many times in human history, including this one, uh, that we're looking at historically, when we see examples of this sort of winged utopian leap by people into the open air of possibility. Who are we to say that the ideas and feelings they had about what was possible uh, were simply wrong? And Ernst Bloch tried to, and I will conclude with this, tried to uh, capture this with another metaphor, uh, which, where, which he said, the ocean of possibility is much greater than our customary land of reality. This is what he called the spirit of utopia, not as vain fantasy, but as a sense of the sometimes difficult to imagine world of what really is possible, the possibilities that exist in life, at least, and in history. Uh, and this is an idea I think that was shared by many, many Russians uh, going way well back into the 19th century and into the 20th that I describe in my book, still to come out, uh, but certainly in the moments and the stories that I've been describing here about wings and uh, flight, a way to get out of the darkness and catastrophe, not just to go back to the normal, but into something very uh, new. So thank you. And I'll stop my share. Thank you. Um, a couple of quick questions, and I invite everybody to submit your questions, please, um, in the chat, and I will moderate and uh, share those with our speaker and, and get his viewpoint. Um, but one of the questions I would like to start with is you have a lot of the images of, of the wings and the revolution and, and utopia being connected to flight. Um, one of the things that I found from a number of your images, however, was the characterization of women. <laughs> and um, that that women are um, like pre-revolutionary, they're kind of the evil. So the, the one image you have of the demon on top of the pedestal with everyone trying to tear her down is clearly a woman. Um, she is, um, she also represents the church. She's a monster. Um, she's evil. And the workers with their sledgehammers and, and chisels are taking her down. Um, did you find other instances of a connection between, but then the, the woman of revolution, the woman of the utopia um, is more androgynous, um, less completely woman and more um, a unique figure. But did you find that there is an anti-feminine element to the revolutionary ideals? So that's a, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, it's interesting when I show that poster to my students, the one of Capitol, this big monstrous figure with a crown that is the church dome, uh, they say it's Jabba the Hutt, <laughs> who's male, actually. And the large breasts don't denote to them uh, a woman, but a nor such fatness that even a male figure has uh, large breasts. Uh, that's it. But on the other hand, obviously, there's the issue of the nation. Russia is a feminine word. Nations are always understood as female. The church is seen as a female. A and so there's these abstract ideas of women, of the femaleness of, uh, of the Russia they want to overthrow. But I, I would say I'm almost inclined to think with my students, Jabba the Hutt is actually closer to the point. Uh, a monster of no gender, uh, perhaps. Um, certainly in these years, um, there were real problems with the role of actual role of women in, in the movement. Uh, they were often treated as secondary. However, the ideal of many people, uh, especially you know, activists, uh, was precisely the emancipation of women. So some of the, I quoted Trotsky, I could have quoted Alexandra Kollontai, one of the leading women activists in those years, who says almost the exact same things, except about what women will be capable of. Women can do everything. And ideas, there was a lot of criticism in the West that there was free love at the time. 
uh, there were ideas of emancipating women. Uh, women got the vote in Russia in 1917 before the US. Uh, and, and so I think, yes, there are some images of the nation, uh, but not usually the hostile ones. Um, during the war, there were a lot of female images of Russia fighting, this is coming from the state, uh, in which actually those were not reused to critique, um, uh, uh, to, to see the enemy as, as feminine. So I think the image of, the more image was women as some sort of ideal symbolic quality of virtue, like these flying angels or the leaping women in the May Day poster. So it's a romanticized image of women often. Okay. It doesn't um, mean real liberation necessarily. Well, yeah. true, Thanks. very true. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Barb asks, how quickly did Russians figure out that Utopia hadn't arrived or that it would never arrive? And what did they do when they realized these, this idealized Utopia was not gonna be theirs to grab? Well, there's the history of Russian, there's Russian history all for you. <laughs> I could go and describe each moment of disappointment and what did people do? I'll mention maybe two of them. Uh, so in the 1920s, when it seemed like things were getting very slow, but the economy was getting better, things became stable, the economy was improving, but really there wasn't a new world. It was just getting tolerable uh, in the 1920s. And it was mixed economy, some so part socialist parts, some communist parts, state control, uh, but there were still cafes and restaurants. A lot of people got frustrated with that, especially young people uh, who said, where is our revolution? This isn't what we, we dreamed of. Uh, and so by the late 1920s, they began to think we need a new revolution. And when Joseph Stalin declared in 1928, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start a new revolution, basically. Rapid industrialization, get rid of anybody representing the old classes. Uh, long story of what happened. Many young people saw it as a revolution and embraced Stalinism at that moment, especially 1928 to 31, precisely as an answer. So that's one answer. They refused to believe it hadn't come uh, and said, let's, we just need a new revolution. The other much more common is they got depressed. They left the country if they could afford to, intellectuals. Um, they grew silent. Um, those worker poets, some of which I quoted, uh, pretty much after 1925, 26, if you want a year, that's a good one, uh, began to say, I'm not going to write these poems anymore. I am just going to do what I can to get by. And most of them tried to write very boring poems or did nothing or went back to the factory uh, until Stalin came along. And in 1937, 38, many of them were arrested uh, and executed. Uh, because they were seen in some ways as they must have supported Trotsky or something because they were so uh, revolutionary. Uh, different courses. After World War II, this sense of utopian possibility pretty much vanished uh, until the 90s. Uh, so that's a whole nother story I can go on with. But yeah, it keeps happening uh, again and again. And one could go back before 1917 to moments. But if you need a year, 1926 struck me and my research as a real striking one. But some just said that we need a new revolution. So thanks. People in the Ukraine might disagree with uh, the, the new revolution of his first five-year plan, but, but we can come back to that one in another lecture. He could, he could, he could. <laughs> but, uh, Kate asks, it occurs to me that in the West, during the same period, there was a widespread embracing of progressivist views of human possibility and scientific progress. Is it possible that the Russian utopian impulse might be the other side of the Western progressivist coin? Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. Um, and if you go back further, if you think of where Mar the world of Karl Marx, which is what they're looking back to as a sort of inspiration, the world of Car Karl Marx is also the world of Charles Darwin. Uh, it's sort of scientific ideas about progress. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that the world in different ways had enormous, um, yeah, confidence in possibility. Uh, and science worked for both of them. I mean, as you ironically, uh, Marxism saw itself as scientific socialism, unlike utopian socialism. But in fact, it was a type of scientific utopianism shared about around the world. There was unlimited possibility. We could comment about how that fits our own times and attitudes towards science in interesting ways in the middle of a pandemic. Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. These, these ideas have histories. Thank and you. That, Absolutely, that, I agree. 
that blends into the next question from Ray Bertino. Your talk reminds me of the idea of communism being a religion as, refer as, referred, sorry, as referred to often in titles such as The God That Failed. In your opinion, did communism fulfill the idea of an atheistic religion? If so, do we need a new definition of religion? If analyzing an ideology, how do we tell whether it meets the definition of a religion? Very complex question. Um, so two, two aspects. Did it fulfill the idea? Not for many people. Um, I think a lot of people in Russia, st still in the Soviet Union, uh, still thought it wasn't enough. It was okay for some, but for many, religion is still religion, and Christianity in particular, Judaism at a certain point, Buddhism, Islam, were still more compelling. And so the ability to crush religion by offering an alternative, which definitely was what was created, an atheistic religion, uh, didn't work. And why that didn't work is a whole story in and of itself that would take me too long to explore, but is a really interesting one. But do we need a new defini definition of religion? Um, there are other definitions of religion that see it as uh, the realm of the sacred, the realm of a millenarian belief in a transfigured world of salvation, resurrection, and the like, that see religion as actually not spilling over into the secular realm, but as actually in, imbuing the secular realm with religious uh, ideas, whether that's religion as such, or the religious or the sacred is, is a definitional one, but I, I think we need to expand how we think about the religious uh, for understanding uh, a good deal of Russian history. One can go back, as I do in my book actually, uh, to the early 19th century especially, and see people who insisted that they were scientific secularists, uh, but believed in, for example, the story of Jesus Christ was a great story that everybody should embrace one of the best stories in humanity, even though they didn't believe in the divinity of Christ, uh, who looked to the Judeo-Christian religion, uh, traditions in particular, and its promise of salvation and of a new heaven and new earth uh, as exactly the sort of things they believed in. And they didn't think of it as metaphorical, but as something to draw on in a sort of emotional and intellectual uh, way. If you narrow the definition of religion to the church or to churches, you miss how powerful those ideas are. Uh, I think throughout utopianism, one can see the importance of religion. And the other side of it is, you know, we, we might say, well, utopia will never happen, right? Uh, even though it's, it has these religious elements. What if we reversed it and said, well, all religions are false because people are hoping for things that will never happen. But people do believe things are possible. Uh, that what religion promises, which still has never come, we haven't reached that other messianic world, and yet look how deeply people believe in it. Should we say they're all fools and they should just get a life and understand science and ignore those deep beliefs? I think it's the same question applies. It should take seriously that people keep believing in that possibility in the form of religion for some. Yeah, and even without religion, the, the, I would argue the basis of human nature is believing in the possible. So, yeah, um, I agree. There's uh, Ernst Bloch, three books, giant fat books. There are three volumes of this thing simply called The Principle of Hope. Yeah. And this is his sort of theory of utopia. It's, a, it's got like 4,000 pages, but it's, yeah. uh, it all documents exactly what you just said. Yeah. That is the nature of, that's the history of the world. Yeah. Dr. Kapanji, did you have a question you wanted to ask out loud? Yeah. Yes, I have it printed. On the, on the first uh, anniversary of the Russian Revolution, was there any acknowledgement of the ending of World War I with the surrender of Germany on November the 11th, 1918? That occurred about the same time mm -hmm. as the first anniversary uh, uh, of the Russian Revolution. And if not, if, there, if the Bolsheviks did not acknowledge it, was it because of embarrassment of the Soviets because of their role in the peace treaty with Germany, the Brest-Litovsk Pact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Brest-Litovsk is such a strange moment because as I said, everybody demanded an end to war, to this war in particular, uh, and just hoped it would go away, really just turn their back on and it would disappear. 
And they didn't know how to do it, but the approach was what they tried at Brest-Litovsk. And that was to just make the Germans accept that the Russians were not their problem. Just go and fight in the West, who cares? Which it happened again in World War II when Stalin more or less said, you know, uh, whatever you do in the West is not our problem. Uh, although they, there was always the hope in 19, uh, during World War I that it would lead to revolution if the Germans continued to fight. Um, the trouble is the Germans were not interested in giving up anything. And in return for getting out, Russia getting out of the war, the Russians had to give up a huge amount of land. Horrible, basically the occupation of Ukraine, uh, among others. And it was the only way they could get out of the war. Uh, they continued to believe, though, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if they gave up some of their best land, they gave up Ukraine, Germans could march in, because ultimately, and it's amazing how deeply people believe this, party leaders, certainly, uh, but also a lot of ordinary workers, uh, especially, not so much peasants, uh, believed that people would see the evil of the Germans. There was just, this was, everybody was convinced, we can argue now who's to blame for World War I, but at the time it was said the Germans were, because they're a horrible imperial power and they have no respect for, for democracy or freedom. And of course now Russia was a democratic country, right? And so the idea was not embarrassment, but it's just one more bad moment. And so the surrender of Germany was only seen as a blip in what ultimately would happen. People would realize imperialism, lack of freedom was evil, war was evil, and there'd be this revolution. And if one wants to ask the biggest moment of disappointment, it was the, the lack of revolutions across Europe. There were little ones, you know, Rosa Luxemburg and all of these various things in Germany and a few other places. But the idea that the whole world would rise up and create a, a warless, a society without war, because this taught them the lesson, the war to end all wars, as it were, uh, this was an incredible disappointment. Uh, and, and one that really shocked people. So I'd say that's how they reacted to it, is it wasn't even an important event. It was just one more toward what would really be exciting, and that is world revolution, which never happened. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question, if you guys are willing to hang around. Um, uh, Joni asks, the image of the eagle is perpetuated in the large gold eagle perched atop a very large auditorium on the grounds of the Kremlin. It's a mythical bird with two heads looking in two directions, always dreaming of new possibilities and conquests. What do you think about this great vision? Well, this is great. Of course, the two-headed eagle is the Byzantine symbol. It goes back mm -hmm. to the Byzantine Empire, which the Russian Empire adopted. Uh, and it became the symbol of uh, Tsarism. And it, there's all sorts of ways of interpreting what the two-headed eagle was. They were all torn down. From 1917, they were pulled off every fence, off the Kremlin, they were all gone. Uh, and replaced often by red stars. So that big double-headed eagle that's way on the top of the Kremlin on, on the tower, there's several of them, uh, was gone until the 1990s and replaced by a big red star, a symbol of global possibility. It came back, uh, with the 90s, not as a symbol of possibility, a very cynical symbol, sadly, although I like your interpretation, it's much better uh, than the real one, which is really just cynical. It's just to say, well, communism's over, we're going to go back, we're going to pretend nothing happened. Let's pretend it didn't happen. And we'll adopt all the symbols of imperial Russia, including ones that from any monarchist's point of view, you cannot use. You can't use monarchist symbols if you have no monarch. So they have the crown, the double-headed eagle, they have the, the orb and scepter, all the symbols of the monarchy, but they don't have a monarchy. Uh, it's just a cynical attempt to say, oh, Russia is still here, Russia never went away. And, and of course, we could go on to talk about cynical uses of history and historical connections under in Putin's Russia uh, till, the, till the, the eagles fly back, as it were. Uh, but I think that's what it means. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a great vision anymore, sadly. Well, I think you should be careful of dismissing Tsar Putin in that fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I could get in trouble. Historians have been in trouble. I know. Yeah. I, I used so, to be more restrained in, in trying to give Putin the benefit of the doubt, but it's getting harder and harder. Definitely, I agree. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Steinberg. On behalf of the Peoria Area World, Steinberg, <laughs> on behalf yeah. of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, this has been a very lively discussion. It's not usually a, a way that we look at Russia's history. So I appreciate um, this imagery. I would recommend a book, as you were talking about the turn of the century, Andre Belli's uh, Petersburg came mm -hmm. to mind. Uh, the dancer with her cape and the, you know, the imagery oh, of the, the wings um, and the, you know, making the city of St. Petersburg slash Leningrad later um, almost a human. Um, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, so with that, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Next week, we have a program on the two Koreas with um, Dr. Chi Hoon Kim here at Bradley University. And so next Friday, uh, join us for that. Tuesday night, I sent you all a note about A Hunger Ward, which is a film by Nicholas Kristoff. It is free and it is a very um, eye-opening look at the war going on in Yemen that we don't pay any attention to, frankly. Um, and so if you're not yet a member of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, I invite you to join us. And again, Dr. Steinberg, thank you very much. This was a really fabulous program. Have a great thank evening, you. everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thank sir. you. Thank you. Thank you. Exceptionally well done. Thank you.